Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. It's an exciting day today. I have finished the mechanical assembly on my simple amateur radio receiver. Let's check it out. Let's start by taking one last look at the 3D model. Like I said in earlier episodes, I was really pushing the limit to fit everything inside this small case, and using solid modeling was pretty much the only way to avoid finding gross interferences later during assembly. And that was definitely the right decision because I ended up with some really small clearances in a couple areas, especially between the receiver printed circuit board and the RF gain and filter pots, as well as the entire area around the notch filter pot. I also said earlier that I wanted a method for mounting the display that didn't have screws protruding through the front panel, and this is what I came up with. This large piece here is an adapter that mates to the inside surface of the front of the case. It's held in place by the six rotary controls. The adapter has features for locating the display and a provision for two sets of number three hardware which work together with two clamp bars to secure the display. Naturally, I 3D printed these parts, and this is how they fit together with the display. The four holes in the display board are really tiny. They're too small even to fit number three size screws, so I'm just using stubby little pins on the adapter in those holes for locating the display. With the two clamp bars held in place by the screws to the adapter, I now have a robust subassembly and avoid having visible fasteners on the front panel. Jumping back to the 3D model for a moment, I designed a center bezel to put a shadow frame around the display, as well as give a slightly elevated area around the RF gain and crystal filter pots. That's all just for aesthetics, it breaks up the monotonic look of the front panel and allows me to have a separate graphics area just for those two controls. I'm using a single undercut hook to capture it at the top, and then using the nuts on the two pots to sandwich it to the front panel. Okay, it's time to cut some metal. I did the usual technique of printing out paper templates to scale, then use them to mark the centers of the various holes. It's a simple method, but it does work very well. I used a center punch dialed down in strength to mark the hole centers. For the display aperture, I used a Sharpie to shade the edge of the opening. One small oopsie though. Even with the center punch dialed back to low strength, it did still dent the case. Guess I should have used a scrap piece of wood on the other side as a bucking block, but no big deal. The dents hammered out easily. I did tape up the back of the case to protect it from scratches, but I didn't bother to do that for the front panel because it's all going to be covered up later with my graphics. And here's the final result. I used a hand nibbler to chew out the display aperture. Those are hard to control to get perfectly straight edges, but again, no big deal. The bezel will hide all the raw edges anyway. I drilled small holes first and then used a step drill to enlarge them, which generally works fine, but a step drill does tend to wander off center unless you clamp your work down, which wasn't practical here, so a couple of holes ended up drifting off center. Now it's actually the adapter that locates all the controls, so slightly oversized and off center holes in the case don't hurt anything. The center hole for the B and C connector in particular wandered off, but it still lines up fine with the connector and everything's hidden when it's in place. The next metal cutting exercise was the standoffs. I needed 7 at 8 millimeters long for the receiver printed circuit board and 4 at 15 millimeters long for the audio board. 8 millimeters is not a standard length, but no worries, these 10 millimeter long ones are made from a soft brass alloy and are easily machined down to the proper length. Yeah, having a mini lathe does make this step a lot easier. The last item before starting assembly was to pre-wire the board with as many of the wires as possible. That reduces the amount of soldering that has to be done inside the tight confines of the case. At this point I have all the parts on hand that I intended to purchase. I finished fabricating all the parts I was going to make myself. I even built some of the sub-assemblies and have some of the final wiring connections made. So from one aspect you could say I've got my mise en place going here and you'd probably be right. It, come to think of it though, I have been watching quite a few YouTube videos of Chef Jean-Pierre lately though. So with all the prep work out of the way, I started assembly. The first item I attached was the receiver board, and that turned out to be a mistake. Seems that I overlooked the fact that the adapter subassembly and all the lower row of controls have to go in first. There's just no way to fit them in place after the receiver board is installed. 
but no worries, I just had to remove the screws holding the board and then I could wiggle it out of the way just enough to get the adapter sub-assembly and all the controls in place. That little mistake aside, the rest of the assembly went just fine. You can really see just how little the clearance is between the lower pots and the receiver board. It's less than a millimeter. And here's what it looks like after all the controls and wiring are done. I tried to be as neat as practical with the wiring. I kept it short for the closest controls, and for the two encoders I took a few extra minutes to practice my wire harness lacing skills. <laughs> yeah, I've got a ways to go before I'm at the level of the folks who used to do this in production decades ago. For initial testing trials, I think I'll go with the 40 meter, 20 meter, and 15 meter filters. I still have a spot available for an AM broadcast band filter, and I might fab one up for the final episode just to see if it has any benefit. The last two items for the mechanical construction are the knobs and front panel graphics. Originally I thought I'd make the graphics from water slide decals, but I changed my mind and decided to use the laminate method instead. I used that technique a while back for my spectrum analyzer, and that turned out great. In any case, I started by using Publisher to create the graphics design. I decided to keep the design plain, although I am using a bit of color here for the center bezel and of course featuring the Level Up Double E Lab logo. So here's what it looks like inkjet printed on glossy photo paper. Laser printing would be a bit sharper, but I'm not planning on putting my eyes that close to the receiver to really tell the difference. The next step is to laminate it, and I get to use my laminator to actually make lamination instead of making PC boards for a change. I use 5 mil stock and that seems to work very well. They do come in thinner and thicker options, but I have to admit I've not tried anything other than the 5 mil. Once it's out of the laminator, cutting it out is pretty easy. I did put faint cutting lines on the artwork to use as guides. I don't have to be too crazy with the accuracy of the cuts because most of the cut edges are going to be hidden anyway. The lone exception though is the bottom edge of the front panel artwork. I thought about designing and printing a trim piece, but I decided not to go that way. And here's the final product. Like I said, it's a plain design, but I think it's appropriate for this tiny receiver. In CAD, I played around with several different designs for the knobs and ultimately decided on two different styles. One style for the two controls under the display and another style for the four other controls. Each knob took around an hour to 3D print, and they just press fit onto the control shaft. Let's give it the customary joyride on my giant cake turntable so we can see all sides of it. All in all, I'm happy with how the design turned out. It was challenging for sure to stuff everything inside that small case, and it's yet to be determined just how convenient or inconvenient doing the filter swaps will be. As it stands now, I have to remove and reinstall the cover and its four screws every time I do a swap. So for sure, having a hinged cover would make that a lot easier, but I'm not quite sure how to do that yet. And finally, I can't resist making a couple of relative size comparisons. So this is how the receiver stacks up to a deck of cards. They're almost the same height. And here it is as compared to my iPhone 11. It's actually a bit smaller than the iPhone. Now that's impressive. <laughs> All kidding aside, at 130 millimeters wide by 69 millimeters high by 110 millimeters deep, not counting the knobs or connectors, it is a diminutive size for a home-built HF receiver that has these many features. So that is it for the mechanical assembly on this little guy. It's all complete. Things that are remaining, I do have to do the final calibration and adjustment of the AGC circuit. Uh, there's a few software bugs and tweaks I still want to put in place. Things like I got to set the calibration curve for the S meter. Uh, the display of the bands is presently backwards from the way the filters are actually placed in the radio, so that's an easy fix. And I do want to take a look at that AM broadcast band reject filter. When my preliminary testing so far, I think I I'm picking up a little too much uh, AM uh, broadcast uh, signal coming through, and I'll give that filter a try. So all of that will be in the next episode, which will be the 10th and the final, hopefully final episode on this project. As always, I want to thank Jim Forkin, amateur call sign WA3TFS, for his excellent material and help he's been giving me as I've gone through this project. So thanks very much, Jim. And to you, the viewers, if you've enjoyed this and haven't left comments, please feel free to do so now. And for sure, if you haven't subscribed, I appreciate it if you would and get those notifications for future videos. So thanks very much and bye for now.